important issues and events in the Middle East, live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK, 690 AM, and WDMV, 700 AM. Good morning to everybody. In 1979, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat said, if Egypt were to ever go to war again, it would be over water. Amid the Egyptian, Ethiopian, Sudanese dispute over the Nile uh, water, both countries, or the, at least Egypt and Ethiopia, both made references to the potential use of force. Generally, the Middle East has only 1% of the world's fresh water shared among 5% of the world's population. But water disputes are all over the planet Earth, and water wars threaten death by thirst or death by bullets. To discuss the Ethiopia, Sudan, Egypt dispute, and more generally, water wars, we have a group of distinguished guests and experts from Washington, D.C. We have Ambassador Professor David Chin, who at one point was U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia, and now he is professor at George Washington University. From Virginia, we have journalist Omar Radi Ahmed, editor-in-chief at the Ethiopian news agency Ephrathia Media and Communication. From London, we have award-winning journalist Adel Dorwish, who has written six books, one of which is Water Wars, Common Conflicts in the Middle East. And from Egypt, from Cairo, Dr. Mohammed Nasr Alam, Professor of Water Resources Engineering at Cairo University, and former Minister of Water Resources and Irrigation in Egypt. We are coming to you not only on radio, but also on video, on Facebook. So go to U.S. Arab Radio Facebook on Facebook and, and see us there uh, to, see, to see how we look like um, on Zoom. And let's get started. My first question will go to all our, our four guests. Uh, so please, I, I ask um, my four guests to be brief because we have only one hour and, and four guests. Um, could the Egypt-Ethiopia dispute lead to war between the two countries and why? Let's start with Mr. Darwish in London. Uh, it could be uh, if they mishandle it. Um, however, it will be rather um, unwise. It won't lead to anything because war is a tool of foreign policy if you have an overall objective. What's the objective? Unless you actually force Ethiopia, if even if the Egyptians have the same power like the United States or Russia, uh, to actually have a unity between the two countries so they become one country, which is actually not visible. Uh, but I have other solution than war. War would be extremely foolish, costly, and it won't achieve anything. Ambassador Shin. I think that there's always that possibility. I think it's highly unlikely that it will result in any kind of uh, military conflict between Ethiopia and Egypt. Uh, there are too many reasons not to engage in a military response and far more reasons to try to find a cooperative way out of this dilemma. There would be no winner, in my view, in a military confrontation uh, between the two sides. And yet there is a lot that could be gained uh, if, if there is compromise and understanding on both sides. Mr. Rari Ahmed. Yeah, I joined the other uh, speakers in saying war is not the right solution. And I believe both uh, countries have at least uh, some wise leadership that uh, would 
uh, see that it is not the right response. But in your reference, in your introduction, you mentioned that both Ethiopia and Egypt had made reference uh, uh, to war as a solution, uh, but Ethiopia hasn't made any refer that kind of reference. Ethiopia has only responded to uh, such war threats uh, from Cairo that if Cairo is going to go to war over war uh, over the waters, Ethiopia would uh, would be able uh, to defend itself, and Ethiopia just said it, it is capable of defending itself. Dr. Alam and Cairo. Well, in fact, uh, good morning first for all of you. <laughs> and uh, I would like to say war should be يعني, the last, the last solution. I don't like the fact to see this happening. But uh, we have to ask ourselves what could be the reason for war. You see, reason for war is not uh, to be really a major force like U.S. or Russia or whatever, as some of us mentioned. No. It is if you are defending your life, even if you are weak or strong, it doesn't matter. You have to go for it. So this is the issue. The issue is that Egypt rely 100% on the Nile water, and not for centuries, but for thousands of years. And uh, any touch of the amount of water which is received by Egypt from the Nile water, from the Nile River, will be uh, announcement of war. And uh, in fact, Egypt, in, even in very bad conditions, Egypt receives 55.5 billion cubic meters per year. Population is 105 million persons. Per capita water share less than 550 cubic meters per person or per capita. So water poverty there is huge. The food gap is about $1 billion per year. So the situation is miserable. And uh, a large part of the drinking water from the salinated water, no rainfall, nothing else other than the Nile water. Then you are asking for war or not. No, it is asking for life, for their rights to survive. And this is the issue. Second issue is the government. You have to deal with a strong government, a stable country, in order to reach to a peaceful solution. Unfortunately, Ethiopia is not in very good situation. A lot of problems inside, and uh, as stated even by the United States many, many times, uh, they have major problems. There is no okay, money. Uh, Dr. Alam, person. we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss some of those points later in the program. Yeah. But but let me let me just take it one step at a time. Uh, Ambassador Shin, uh, why the U.S. in your view couldn't get the two parties? Uh, of course, we are we are talking also about Sudan uh, included, but mainly Ethiopia and Egypt. Why? the U.S. couldn't get the two parties to sign an agreement when uh, it, it has a friendly relationship with, with both countries, with both Egypt and Ethiopia. Well, the fact that the United States has a, a friendly relationship with all three countries uh, does not really give it that much leverage in order to force an agreement that one or more of the parties are not willing to go along with. There, there has to be a willingness to compromise uh, on behalf of all three countries. And we haven't seen much compromise so far. There, I think there has been agreement on some elements of how to handle the water issue on the Blue Nile, uh, particularly at the technical level. Uh, but as we all know, there are at least two major outstanding problems dividing particularly the position of Ethiopia on the one hand and Egypt, and to some extent, Sudan on the other. And there just hasn't been the ability to bridge that gap. And the United States, is, nor any other group, is not in a position to force uh, an agreement by the three parties. Mr. Uh, Rodi Ahmed, uh, you are uh, familiar with the Ethiopian position. And now, um, th there was an agreement, a draft agreement under President, uh, former President Trump. Uh, both Egypt and uh, Sudan signed and agreed to it. 
Ethiopia declined to sign. Why is that? Uh, Ethiopia considered that um, agreement a violation of its uh, uh, sovereignty, and it is an imposition by uh, what is uh, known to be a world power uh, without its will um, in favor of uh, particularly Cairo, uh, because uh, the U.S. Washington wanted to use Cairo as a bulwark in its uh, efforts in the Middle East, and it, 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 it offered Ethiopia as a sacrificial lamb. In the statements of former President Donald Trump and his uh, people from his administration, especially if the Treasury Secretary, who were involved in, in the Washington negotiations, you can see the disrespect and the arrogance and the disregard to Ethiopians and Ethiopian interests in the, in the process. So it was like telling Ethiopia to sign this or loot uh, US uh, money that uh, comes or um, in, in, in short, I'll put it, the Trump administration considered Ethiopia just another African country who should accept any Western terms, whether uh, it was in line with its national interests and uh, national security uh, priorities and development needs. So it disregarded Ethiopia's needs and wanted to impose uh, uh, terms that Ethiopians consider completely valid. It's, it's uh, our, uh, you know, sovereignty. Uh, Dr. Alam, would you like to respond? Yes, of course. Yes, it's my pleasure. Uh, in fact, uh, this was a surprising uh, turnover of the whole process by Ethiopia. In fact, the situation that Egypt and Sudan approves them, no problem. According to the objectives announced by Ethiopia since 2011, that is the dam is for power generation. So Egypt and Sudan, they signed the agreement in 2015, says that Ethiopia has the full right to use the Nile water for power production and develop their own people. No problem at all. But let us agree on principles of operation and maintenance and, 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 and the filling. They got in the United States, the United States brought the experts of the World Bank, who are the best experts in the world, negotiated with the three countries for three months, and they arrived at a draft for Operation Mentor, Operation Infinity. Then Ethiopia said, no, I need a share of water. That's completely different from the first announcement. They need a share of water, not rather using the land water for power development. Is Ethiopia is entitled to have a share of water or not, of course it is entitled and we can work together on this. But if there is enough water, there is no enough water for, at present time. How we can think about bringing some water for Ethiopian people, particularly during droughts? Let's work together. But to have a share of the Nile water, which is already divided by Egypt and Sudan for thousands of years, this was the amazing thing. And that to stop the everything, and that is the reason. I think well, the, there okay. is there is. Yeah, uh, hold, hold on just a second because uh, we need to go um, to a break right now. But when we come back, I have a question for Mr. Uh, Adel Darwish. Uh, he, he talked a minute ago about uh, possible solutions uh, um, rather than going to war. Uh, we will discuss that with Mr. Darwish uh, after the break. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. While we've been staying safe at home, scientists have been on a journey. The destination, a COVID-19 vaccine. This journey began decades ago with research into other coronaviruses. Scientists built from there with months of research and development, cooperation with other experts worldwide, 
and clinical trials on tens of thousands of volunteers of diverse race, age, and health status. They arrived at a safe, effective vaccine, and hundreds of thousands in Michigan have already been vaccinated. But the next step is ours. We need to get the vaccine when we can. Keep wearing masks correctly and taking precautions until we reach our destination, freedom from COVID-19 and getting back to the lives we love. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bonham serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all seafood. CDC guidelines and is open every day, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. I am Atif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Valadi. We are coming to you not just on radio, but also on video. Go to Facebook, the page of U.S. Arab uh, radio and see us there. Uh, my question now goes to Mr. Adel uh, Dorwish. Um, you talked um, in the first part about possible solutions to the Egyptian Ethiopian Nile problem. Uh, can you uh, outline some of those solutions, please? Yes, first, should take politics, especially ideology, from it. I was quite surprised by Omar's sort of answer and to a certain extent Dr. Alam's response uh, about sort of intervening in, in sovereignty and all of that while the United States is trying to present a solution. So if we leave this nonsense aside, let's talk about a short-term solution and long-term solution. On the short term, the uh, Blue Nile only presents 20% of the flow of Nile water uh, coming north of Khartoum, which would have been uh, 72.8 cubic uh, 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 kilometer. Okay. What happened to the other 80%? Other 80% is coming from the White Nile, uh, which about 55% of it evaporates in the Sud area in South Sudan. That evaporation actually is, is bigger than the flood coming from Ethiopia. So the Egyptians and the Sudanese should really go ahead with the Jungli Canal Project 1, Jungli Canal Project 2, and that would increase the flow of the Nile water and what's lost from evaporation would be equal, if not more, for Egypt and Sudan than the money coming from the uh, uh, Blue Nile. The long-term solution is by 2050, the Nile Basin, 11 countries, but population will reach 800 million people. And with a minimum need for 1 million liter per person per year, that's not enough. I'm proposing a water bank, a water bank like a hydraulic, a hydraulic common market between the 11 riparian nations to share water crops, electricity, because you can you generate electricity when you can grow crop, you use water. Rice, for example, which people think is low water, it only uses about 4,000 liters for a kilogram, while cotton, for example, uses about 10,000 liters in the United States, 12,000 liters in India, and so on. Uh, so the, the, the nation that have resources of water, that's like putting a deposit in the bank, 
it's worth a dollar equal one uh, uh, million liter, and that would be their deposit, their interest on it, minus what they use locally. Other people downstream will actually be borrowing this water like a mortgage, like a loan you're getting from the bank. You pay interest on it to that general bank. Money is used, build a, 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 a railway line, which was Cecil Rhodes' dream, the railway, railway line in Africa, Cairo to Cape Town, east to the west, uh, from electricity generated, uh, export crops that you can grow cheaply, import crops that you cannot grow cheaply, and so on. And that would be a solution until the next century. That is actually the way of thinking forward between the 11 riparian nation rather than talking rhetoric about war and ideology and politics. Dr. Alam, any comment? Yes, in fact, uh, uh, this is in fact proposed by Egypt even during the NTB uh, framework. <laughs> and uh, rather, this, this positive solution. What is positive solution? In fact, it's not only in South Sudan, a lot of losses. Uh, but also in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Uganda, in Ethiopia itself, in Mashar Marshes, there are losses about 7 billion cubic meter a year, which can be saved for the people of Ethiopia. So if we got together and let us get use of the Nile River, really, so either in hydropower production, as my friend uh, said in, from London, or even for water harvesting, for increasing the water supply of the Nile River, all of us can be happy. In fact, even I'm proposing the people who are using more water, they can pay more in the development of this project for the sake of the people who are using less water. For example, Egypt should pay the largest share in uh, this particular project, so like John Giri, like Bahri Ghazal. Bahri Ghazal itself also has about 7 or 8 billion cubic meters of water, which can be saved from losses. So this is, I think, this should be the approach. How we can live together? How we can maximize the benefits of the Nile River Basin for the sake of all people of the Nile Basin, not for the sake of one or two countries? And I think I propose this myself to the Minister of Water Resources in Ethiopia in 2010. And I told him, you have in Mashar Marshes and you have in Subat River, huge losses. Let us work together for the sake of Ethiopia. I know that Ethiopia is subject to great droughts and they hurt a lot of people and the animals. Let's work together. But they did not agree by that time. And I hope they change their mind. This is solution. And uh, I pay a lot of credit for... Uh, the expert from London, thanks a lot for his uh, idea. Mr. Rari Ahmed. Yeah, uh, Ethiopia has always been, uh, been in the side of uh, mutual benefit and uh, uh, using the Nile water resources uh, for uh, development of all riparian nations. That's exactly what Ethiopia has been uh, after. And that, that and by, by that I mean Ethiopia has been opposing the water hegemony uh, uh, that Egypt has always wanted to maintain. Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Alam indicated, the Nile water has been shared only between Egypt and Sudan for years and years. And the rest of the riparian, riparian nations want that to change. And Ethiopia happens to take the lead with uh, uh, the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. I should also mention that uh, some of the concerns, uh, if genuine, by Cairo, um, have, have been addressed by, by now over the past two rounds of fillings. Has there been any significant discount in the flow of the Nile waters to Egypt and Sudan? In fact, Sudan is still affected by flooding, even after Ethiopia has completed the second round of filling. So Egypt's um, concern and allegations that this dam threatens the flow of the water is actually proven to be wrong. So the solution is always within the African Union, with African solutions uh, for African problems, for these countries to continue to, no to, ne to negotiate and discuss 
have uh, common uh, acceptable uh, terms. And th these negotiations, let's not forget, are not about water sharing agreements or about Nile water sharing agreements. These negotiations are about the Ethiopian, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam so far. So if it is about night water sharing agreement, it has to involve all the riparian nations. That should be the way with um, uh, respecting and understanding the development needs of each upstream countries and downstream countries. That should be the way. Ambassador Shin, if you were to mediate um, between the different countries here, uh, how do you get the three parties to resolve the dispute diplomatically? Before um, answering that question, if I could very briefly comment on two points that were made earlier. Uh, concerning the Jungle Canal, I would certainly agree that if the Jungle Canal were to go forward, it would increase significantly the amount of water reaching the Aswan Dam in Egypt. The problem is it was about two thirds completed when civil war shut it down. And South Sudan has shown no willingness uh, so far to move forward with the canal. So I'm not particularly optimistic that there's any willingness to go forward with the uh, Jungle Canal. On the issue of better water usage in the Nile Basin, I certainly agree with what other speakers have said. It must be improved, but it also needs to be improved in Egypt, uh, where there are leaky canals on the one hand, and there are some crops being grown that are very water intensive and different crops could be selected in order to reduce water usage. On the question of mediation, there have been various efforts uh, to come up with uh, efforts to mediate uh, the problem. Uh, the first one was aborted when the United States uh, tried to do it alone uh, during the Trump administration. We've already discussed that. Uh, it was then moved effectively to the African Union where it is today uh, so far, that has not produced any result, and indeed, uh, the African Union is going to have to take a far more assertive approach to the problem than it has so far if there is going to be any success. Uh, I don't see this uh, moving to the United Nations, uh, as Egypt has proposed, because the five permanent members of the Security Council have basically said they want to take a neutral position on it. They don't want to mediate it. So I, I think it's, it's sort of stuck in the, the African Union, that the African Union must step up to the challenge. But Ambassador Shin, uh, do you believe uh, that uh, the Egyptian concerns are somehow overblown? Well, I think concerns on all sides are occasionally overblown. Uh, I, I think that on the, from the Egyptian point of view, one has to look at what the, the short-term threat is to filling the reservoir behind the dam. Uh, I, I don't see that as being a particular threat to Egypt unless you have several very bad years of rain in the Nile Basin where you have very low flows of water. Then it could be a threat uh, to Egypt. That has not been the case uh, last year or so far this year. The rains have been quite good. So when you have good rains, uh, you're probably not going to have a, um, a threat to the, the amount of water reaching Egypt. And therefore, I, I think it's not helpful to make a big problem out of it. The bigger issue is, what if you have five, six years of long-term drought in the region? Uh, then you have to have some compromises as to how to move the water down the river. When we come back uh, after the break, we are going to get a comment from Dr. Alam in Cairo, but also we'll ask Dr. Darwish um, about other major water disputes, potential wars in the Middle East after the break. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical 
physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. Imagine you're on a train track somewhere miles away. A train is headed your way. You can't see it yet, but it's coming slowly but surely. If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may be on the wrong track and diabetes could be heading your way. Bit by bit, the danger is getting closer and closer. So should you stay on the track you're on now or move to make a change and reduce your risk? If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may qualify for the National Diabetes Prevention Program in your local community. This one-year program could be the ongoing support you need to put you on the right track. Not only did participants lose weight, they cut their risk of type 2 diabetes in half. Ready to get on board for a healthier future? Learn more about the National Diabetes Prevention Program and what else you can do to manage and prevent diabetes at michigan.gov slash diabetes. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji. And at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you. And I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F. Or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. I am Atif Abdel Jawa. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are talking about uh, water wars, uh, the dispute uh, between Egypt, um, Sudan on the one hand, and Ethiopia on the other. And uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Alam in Cairo whether um, the Egyptian concerns uh, may be overblown, given that we have some alternative solutions, including the gazelle sea option here. Uh, in fact, there are several comments I hear, and uh, maybe due to the lack of the background, scientific background, there are some confusion. I'll try to explain it very quickly. The one thing some people said, what is the harm for Egypt if it is flood years, no drought years? No, there is a significant harm. How is that? There are two harms here in the system due to the filling of the reservoir. One harm to Sudan, which is immediate reaction and the actions, and another one long-term harm to Egypt. Why? Because Egypt has the highest one there. I as one dam is storing the high flood years to use it in the low flood years. So even if there is a very high flood, it should be stored in the highest one dam. Where the water or water storage uh, in uh, Renaissance Dam come from? From Egypt's water share, not from Sudan water share. Sudan use all the water, then the remaining go to Egypt, reduced by the amount of filling in the Renaissance Dam. And this amount of filling will affect the overall storage or the hundred years storage, as you call it, scientifically. And that will impact Egypt very much in the drought years. That's why Egypt is asking for official legal agreement between Egypt and Ethiopia regarding the operation and the filling of the dam. 
taking the water to fill the dam in five years, three years, seven years, no problem. But the most important thing is take this water back during the drought for Egyptians to drink and cultivate. This one thing. The second thing, the water conservation projects in Sudan, South Sudan, or Ethiopia, or Rwanda, or Burundi, this is not the project just for water savings. This is water, these are pillars for development. I developed I developed a, a, a code for development of South Sudan, which can create new South Sudan, agricultural parks, uh, industrial parks, navigation uh, courses, huge projects which you can develop these countries which are in very bad shape right now. And in fact, will help very much in setting up bees in these countries. So we should not look at it just to save water for us. No, it is also to settle civilization and the good cultural conditions in these countries through huge projects which can attract investment from outside and they can use it for developing these countries. This is the second really uh, thing which is very important. The third thing also in Egypt, the water status is very, very difficult. I said it is 550 cubic meter per capita per year. And the overall efficiency of the system due to recycling, recycling, we are recycling the water about seven times, is, more, is about 79%, which is the largest, the largest in Africa. If you compare it to any African countries, even in the Nile Basin, it is about 30%. The fourth pillar, which we should look at it, to develop the rain-fed agriculture. All these countries, they have huge rainfall. They need just technology. And they need to improve the situation, really, to increase the yield and become uh, real wealth for their own countries. So we have to look at it in this way. The summary of this, that is a lot of potential for getting together, live together in peace, and survival together. But, you see, the rich country should help the poor country, and, and, and this is another thing, how we can get together. But we have to look at how we can survive together not to take the wealth of others in order to survive on the account of other countries. This is really too much. So that's really the situation which bothers the relationship with the Serbian people, although we have long, 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 long history between the civilization of Ethiopia and civilization of Egypt, which are very, very, very old civilizations. And we have to keep and we have to work on it and maintain it rather than talking about wars. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, before um, I ask uh, the next question, uh, and, and it goes to Mr. Uh, Darwish, uh, I want to see if there is any comment uh, on what we just heard. From me, yes. Um, the, it, it's, it's very quickly, uh, obviously, the, uh, uh, what you call the, the, the poverty, the water poverty in the region, when the um, the, the per capita is thou, be, below 1,000, and we heard in Egypt it's about 500. <clears throat> so there is actually genuine water poverty. However, most of the disputes stems from uh, the international law inadequacy in actually dealing with cross-border uh, water resources. Uh, sometimes they use the maritime law, sometimes they use um, other laws. Uh, but, I mean, even... even the definition of water actually is not um, um, clear in international law. What's the difference between a lake and if it's, a, if it's actually a river or if it's actually uh, a sea? Uh, so if you, if you name it, it becomes difficult. And what we actually, actually have seen here is um, the blight from Omar and from Dr. Alam is, is actually kicking the can down the road because both are waiting for an external power like the United States, the African Union, United Nations to intervene. And we have seen in every dispute worldwide, when you broaden it, you actually kicking the can down the road, no solution. That's why we voted out of the European Union, for example, here in, uh, in the UK, because we cannot do any business uh, within uh, 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 this, this block. So again, the suggestion would be, A, First of all, the Ethiopians have to actually have to admit that they have violated 
a major principle of international law, which is not taking into account the customary use. I cannot actually buy the land in front of your house and suddenly build a land and block your way to use the main road and the main utilities. I have to give you a right of, 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 of way, a uh, right of passage. So here the Ethiopian must admit that they have actually overlooked the customary use in Sudan and East in doing that. But then again, the solution has to be within the, the 11 Riparian states. Leave the, the, the problem with countries like European Union and the Arab League and all that, they are actually ideological rather than practical common market for the use of the people. They're more political than really addressing the need of the people. And that's why actually I want to emphasize it should be a solution with the riparian nations rather than the African Union or UN. So that's just meaning that you're not going to solve the problem. On water disputes and wars, we have seen it before, the six-day war in the Middle East, and I heard that from Arad Sharon himself, the late Israel Prime Minister, because the Arabs were trying to divert the headwater of the Jordan. It actually, when the Syrians were actually using earth moving equipment to divert the water away from Israel, the Israelis actually were got worried and the exchange of fire between the Syrians and the Israelis uh, throughout the spring of 1967 led to war. We have seen a, a mini war in 1978 between Senegal and Mauritania over water. We nearly the Syrian Iraqis and the Turks went to war uh, in, in 1987, 89, because the, uh, the, 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 the Syrians, want, uh, the Turks wanted to build at the Turkey Dam and deprive the uh, downstream uh, countries. In the past, like what happened between India and Pakistan in 1949 and between Syria and Turkey in 1955, when they go to the World Bank to finance a, a hydraulic project like a dam, the World Bank said, right, all of you in the riparian uh, uh, basin, you must actually, when the states in the same basin, you must reach an agreement who uses what. The problem is, like in the case of Ethiopia, uh, when they actually finance it without uh, the, the World Bank, there's no external card to play, no external power. So again, the solution has to be within them. And I repeat again, 2050, 800 million people will be living in the 11 riparian nations. The whole water Nile, as it stands now, is not enough for them in the current economic patterns and economic uh, situation now. They have to reach some kind of a hydraulic common market. Forget about the European Union, forget about the United States, forget about the, the United Nations. The solution will be between the 11 European nations. Mr. Uh, Ravi Ahmed, um, Ethiopia has refused uh, mediations uh, but by the U.S., uh, by the uh, United Nations and other parties, and they insist on just sticking to uh, the African Union. Now the Europeans are offering to give the parties their experience in managing the River Danube, um, which uh, the water is shared by and managed by 11 European countries. Well, do you think that Ethiopia would agree to listen to the Europeans? Uh, you are right, Ethiopia refused uh, mediation or by the U.S. Uh, because the U.S. clearly uh, sided uh, one side, uh, so it, uh, it wasn't in, in its best interest. It clearly stated that, uh, Ethiopia clearly stated that. Uh, but Ethiopia has never refused any um, uh, professional and technical uh, support and um, you know suggestions the the, the like uh, of uh, you the, the, you mentioned uh, by any parties. So Ethiopia has always uh, mentioned that it welcomes such suggestions towards a solution. But Ethiopia has also maintained that it believes in uh, Pan African institutions uh, and uh, since uh, almost all. Uh, uh, riparian nations of the Nile Basin are members of the African Union. Ethiopia believes it's appropriate this ad be addressed uh, within the African uh, Union. I agree with uh, Ambassador David Sheen and uh, Dr. Abdul uh, that th things need to be speeded up and uh, the countries need to work towards uh, uh, the African Union needs to step up 
and the countries need to work uh, earnestly, uh, negotiate earnestly uh, with goodwill to reach uh, agreement. They need to understand each other's concerns and needs for development. But uh, for on the side of uh, Egypt, there is also a need for Cairo uh, to, to accept that uh, colonial era uh, treaties or agreements on Nile water would not be accepted uh, by the rest of riparian nations because they're not part of that uh, agreement. So if you make uh, start the negotiations with, with reference to that, uh, it is uh, the end at the beginning because you, you, you're, you're going to negotiate new agreement, new deal, uh, but you don't have to make, uh, to stick to that uh, old colonial era uh, agreement. Now, there, I also ad, agree with Dr. Uh, Adil that there are other solutions for, uh, uh, you know, uh, avoiding wastage. Uh, there is uh, a huge wastage along the Nile Basin, uh, be it in Egypt or in the rest of the upper uh, upstream countries. Uh, the evaporation on uh, Lake Nasser is uh, huge. I think it's about uh, seven point. Uh, 54 millimeter a day. Uh, it's a, there is a huge loss of water over there. Ethiopia uh, mentioned that uh, uh, th that needs to be addressed as a solution instead of uh, just uh, denying Ethiopia then the, the its rights to uh, build dam on uh, the Nile on the its segment of the Nile uh, basin. So the negotiations should continue. The countries would, should neg negotiate in earnest and understanding of each other's need. And the, uh, on the side of Cairo and uh, Khartoum, there, uh, there is a need for a more proactive uh, approach and a more uh, visible uh, approach to show that they actually respect the African Union instead of taking this uh, issue to other countries such as to other institutions such as uh, the Arab League or the United Nations uh, which rightly uh, returned uh, said that this should be addressed, addressed by the African Union yes uh, mr. Ahmed but uh, so far we haven't seen enough flexibility on the part of the Ethiopian Government, when we come back from the break, I will ask Ambassador Shen about other serious water problems in the Middle East after the break. Ziad Brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Damas Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like frike, hoisi, grape leaves with steak, mashawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebang, shawarma, and much more. Get super-fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. I am Atif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK, 690 AM, 
and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are talking about water wars, water disputes in the Middle East and elsewhere. And my question now for Ambassador Shin, as you um, have heard, uh, Mr. Darwish talked about problems uh, with uh, in Syria, Turkey, Jordan, Israel. Now, which which uh, of those problems uh, are are serious enough, and what can be done about it? Uh, I think you have people on the program who are certainly more knowledgeable than I about uh, water issues outside of the Nile Basin, where most of my expertise is confined. I, I have uh, lived in Lebanon, and I've traveled all over the West Bank and all over Jordan. So I do have some understanding of, of the Jordan River issue and the, the uh, shrinking of the Dead Sea. Uh, in fact, if you go to the point at which the Jordan reaches the Dead Sea, you can literally jump across it. It has shrunk so much. Uh, there, some of the solutions there uh, have been uh, much better use of water, particularly by the government of Israel, although one can argue whether Israel has taken more than its share of water out of the Jordan. But I think some of the technical things that Israel has done have been very positive in terms of water usage. usage. Nevertheless, the Jordan River has shrunk to almost nothing at the point at which it reach, reaches the Dead Sea. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Alam in Cairo, um, uh, how do you see the impact of climate change on the availability, uh, such you know, evaporation, and how will that impact the availability of water resources? Ismail Beijing. And they give some controversial results. But any climate change is one uh, pressing uh, issue on the Nile Basin countries. Another thing is this population, which is also out of control in most of the Nile Basin countries. These are two major things which impact very much our future. And I'm talking also about Egypt in particular here. But uh, I like just to raise one issue, if you allow me. Just uh, one scientific issue that the MIT is the greatest uh, university in the United States has concluded three major studies on Mashar Marsh in Ethiopia and the Jongiri Canal and Bahr Ghazal in the South Sudan. And that's done by Professor Peter Egerson, which is one of the best hydrologists in the world. So I would refer the American investor and my friends, if they like to. Uh, look at these results and see how fruitful it would be in the future if we cooperate together. The second thing which I like to also to, uh, to stress uh, is uh, nothing called really colonial agreements. You see, my friend from Ethiopia saying colonial agreements. For example, Egyptians are talking about 1902 agreement between Great Britain, yes, occupying Egypt and Sudan with the free Ethiopia measured by one of the best kings in the history of Ethiopia, mainly the second. So that's this agreement that we are talking about. It is not colonial any, any uh, from any aspect, talking about the Ethiopian view in this agreement. The second, third thing about it, if there is any agreement you don't like, you have to go to the legal authorities in the world to say, I don't like this agreement, it is not good, it is bad. Not just from your view, I will not work out with this agreement. It, and this never work anywhere in the world. You see, this existing agreements, Ethiopia took a piece of land for, for this agreement. Ethiopia put the borders with, Egypt, with Sudan and Eritrea in this agreement. Ethiopia committed not to touch the Blue Nile water in this agreement without the approval of Sudan. So you cannot say, I don't like it. You say, I have to go to the whatever, whatever court, cancel it. I like just to add one thing is really is if you like to get together. I think Ethiopia even, uh, in the, at least in the public media, they announced some news. The African Union, they done the same. They said, let us separate between two causes. One cause is to solve the issue of the dam. The dam, the three countries agree on the dam. 
And they said it is a must for a Syrian people. It is good for their own development. Let us get together and agree on the operation and the filling process. I don't think we have serious problems in this. And if we have problems, we can use the scientists of the world to solve these problems. No problem. The second thing is how we can ensure water security for Ethiopia and others. This is another thing. This we have to work together, cooperate together. We have even international agreements together. This is another issue which can take years. But this is solve the dam for the sake of the Ethiopian people. Let's agree on filling and regulating process, and then move to the second step, which is long term, how we can get best use of the Nile water for the people of the Nile Basin Camp. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, go ahead. We have only two minutes left, and I still need to go to Mr. Darwish for a sure. final question. Sure, I'll be brief. The 1902 uh, agreement uh, Dr. Adam was uh, referring to was not a water sharing agreement. It is a treaty between Ethiopia and uh, Britain that, that uh, in which Ethiopia agreed not to arrest the flow of the Nile water. Uh, uh, that's the, the, the essence of the agreement as far as I understand it. So Ethiopia is not arresting the uh, flow of the Nile waters. The, we, I was referring to the 1959 and 1929 and those agreements that uh, divided, uh, shared the Nile waters between Egypt and Sudan, disregarding all the nine uh, upper riparian nations. So there is no other water sharing agreement other than these two. So that's what I'm referring to. And if there is a need for water sharing agreement, that all the 11 riparian nations need to negotiate and make an agreement. Otherwise, that agreement naturally is uh, invalid because okay. they were not part of it. Uh, I wish uh, we uh, had more time to discuss this. The discussion can go on forever, can flow as beautifully as uh, the River Nile flows. But unfortunately, we are limited, but um, Mr. Darwish, um, I think in, in your book, uh, you talked about how inadequate international law is in governing water resources. Explain to us. Uh, yes, because actually it's, it, it's really no clear definition. And as we have seen, which is quite really sad, that it's an ideological exchange Opposition. I mean, it's total nonsense to say, you know, the colonial power uh, agreement and so on. So why did you use the colonial made equipment to build the dam? Are you going to turn down the Corona vaccine because it's made by former colonial power? That's just total nonsense. We built on blocks that already exist. That's what international law is. So take an agreement and then try to develop it to Canada. And I keep repeating. The whole of Nile water is not going to be enough in, eight, uh, uh, in 2050 with 800 million people. You really need to actually move forward. So the international law have to actually get a group of lawyers uh, uh, in the International Law Committee in New York and the UN and sit down and talk about actually dispute and try to sort thank out. Thank you, Adel. Thank you. We are running out of time, but you made the point. I thank all my guests. and. Uh, I will see you again the first Friday of next month. Have a good weekend. Thank you.